you can just see on Phillips TBI manifold, look at this whole wall and having to go in here and tear that wall, she makes a dramatic turn right here. So the trick is when you're slicing here, you don't put so much effort because in a corner it will dig twice as fast. We got a clover leaf this side on this port right here. Uh, we got a clover leaf the bottom. So we got the bottom here. Look how much it's off center to center. The top has a lot of meat to cut off here. The bottom has a lot of meat to cut off there. The width has a lot here, none here. This is just typical. This is why you have to go in here and straighten these manifolds out. Now, so you guys don't get screwed on this deal, a lot of these shops, I hate the word, I hate the term, gasket match. That is such bullshit, okay? There ain't no such thing as a gasket match. If it's done right, it's a gasket port. Because you have to go back in there as far as two inches in to get that to cross section out. Because you got to go far enough in where the port starts getting bigger. Let me show you on top of the manifold. Now, when it first comes in, it's your width. Now notice right around here how it starts getting way bigger. This is an expansion rate or a divergency coming from the plenum into the port, okay, is what it's called. And what you got going on is a compression rate. Now, you go back in the manifold till it cross-sections out to the dimensional size of the port in height and width. So I'd say probably somewhere right around there, it's going to start getting bigger then the dimension of the port at the entrance. This is what you have to do. That's not a gasket match. It is a manifold port. Once you've done that, you've about uh, done all you can do for your quick gains and matching it up because after that, it becomes a major deal of reconstructing the blades in the bottom of the manifold. There's all kinds of stuff you can do, which I've actually seen them saw the bottom of the manifolds out so you can get in there and port them. But this is the main thing, making sure that what Elderbrock or whatever company gave you is giving you, because if you don't do this cut to the to where it blends into the biggest part, you're not getting what you paid for with an aluminum performance manifold. It's just something you have to do. And I call them a manifold port. All right. I'll go ahead, finish the clover leaves, let you take a look at that, and then see the material and some snap gauging on it, just so you can see what it is going on. Okay, the clover leaf is done, and it's really weird clover leaf because we got stuff to cut in all different directions and stuff we better not touch. Once again, notice here, then we got some depth here, level here. We got a bunch to cut out on the bottom here and level here. And just to swing around, like I told you, I always do the water ports as well to match the head. That's not too bad. That's pretty close. So then we pull off to right here and look at what we got going on. The left side over here is going to be, I wouldn't say untouched, but it's going to be a lot less. Okay. And no roof here, a little there. Now let's go the other side. Talk about a curve. Not only have I got to cut about an eighth of an inch here over, but then it's got a hell of a turn right here that I got to pull in and pull in. Both of these floors are sky high full of meat that I got to cut out. So like I said, you know, it's just a balancing act, getting them straight to match the head and all. I'm going to go ahead now, pull the clover leaf out. I'm going to go to the giant egg, the big one that I got for raw material removal, then the small egg, and then the uh, blending with the finger all over again. It's funny. It starts with a finger and it ends with a finger. It's just how it works. Alright, anyway, let's get on with this and do some chopping and get it done. And what we're doing now is a little touch-up work. Um... I'm going to zoom in in a second and show you the head and the seat, but as I mentioned earlier, every once in a while you really look up, and I just cannot tell you how stoked I am. Look here. Let me see if I can zoom in. All right. You see the little gray line? 
every one of them ended up just out of trial and error and playing with it being the same width, 10 thousandths from the edge. Now, once you do this, there's our gray seat. What I'm going to do is come in here with a 30 degree and pull it down to where it's about 20 thousandths above the gray line. So I got to I break this edge. Now, I do not do that on the exhaust side. That will can render flow with the port shape that I got. But on the intake, there's just a big giant lip right here. So I'm just going to pull it down because this is a factory OEM valve. Brand new, um, I believe, manufacturers Qualcast. They've known for pretty good OEM valves. And I'll clip the top and put the 30 degree cut on it, okay? Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Got a little bit of oil here coming out, just enough. And like I said, I'm just going to touch it. I can actually see, let me see if you can see that. You can see the oil, let me see if I can skim the top of the valve side. See the gray line? The gray line is right there on the very tippy top. You see where my pen's touching it? That's the gray line right there. It might look a bit shiny. I'm going to trim this top and pull it down to it. And a little small airflow trick. It don't make much. Maybe about... I don't know, a couple of CFM, maybe three at most, but I'll grab it anywhere I can get it. Here we go. Just going to touch off on it. Take it out and check it. You can see that's where I marked them black originally. I think you can see there's a deeper trench. See, if I take my pen and run across it, it'll stop right there. Look how nice it goes off of the casting and it just rolls off. The 30 is just about 15, 10 or 15 thousands from the edge of the gray seat going up. And you can just take your finger and feel. You know that that's going to make a big difference on a little bit of wet flow in CFM. But there's our 30. Goes to the 45. 10,000 from the edge. And just look at the consistency of the gray line. <clears throat> the same width. The same uh, position from the bottom up. Like I said, it's just fate. I mean, I get them extremely close on everything that I do, but just every once in a while you'll look up and it just lays in perfect, and uh, Phillips did that. All right, anyway, just wanted to show you the top cut on the valve, and we'll continue on. Okay, now the part is just a little time consuming. Uh, this is a spark plug thread chaser. Before any head leaves head bites, I chase every hole. Most of the time, I do the spark plug by feel and go through there. It's just from where they've either been sandblasted or rust has occurred. Because nothing in the world is worse than you getting a set of heads and finding out you got a bullet strip. So we go in here, and like I said, back up a little. I chase all of them. The exhaust, uh, there's a little resistance there. I do the exhaust and then I get them done. I'll do the intakes and the valve cover bolt holes on top of the head. I even take my little big one for that and uh, some people still use these factory mounts for the spark plug wires. Uh, I do the side bowls, just everything, because like I said, nothing in the world worse than getting a brand new pair of heads. I've seen it countless times, have a decent amount of machine work done to it, and they just won't take the time to do something as simple as this, going through and threading them and make sure every one of them's done. So I got probably about 35 minutes that I got to do that, clean all the threads, and then they're ready to wash and, and clean up. I'm going to go ahead and CC a chamber and an intake port and find out the big surprise, the volumes, and see what we got, the answer we're looking for. Okay, here's my favorite part of the heads at the end of the day, going in here and verifying exactly what we got. It's kind of been a game over the past 23 years, and 
usually I get pretty close. I can look at it, know how much time I spent, how much it's moved, and try to guess it. I haven't checked it yet. I'd say if I had to guess, remember she was 182 to start with. I'm going to say a 12cc hit. I'm going to say about 194cc is what I'm going to estimate it. Mainly because of the bowl area, the twist and the swirl, a lot was cut out of there. And just a little bit of widening right there where the push rods are. So let's see what we got. See how close I came this time. It'll always eat the first. It's a 100cc barrette and it'll always hit the 100. It sucks it dry. And uh, the second one, it pulls in. I've already got the valves in the chamber and set up with the checker springs so that uh, I can check the combustion chamber volume. And I'll probably go ahead just for uh, S and G's and do an exhaust port, even though I don't pay a lot of attention on that. Uh, I'm going to start trying to keep some records on that for you guys so you can do some comparisons on volumes on that. Uh, problem ain't never been on Chevrolet so much as getting it in is getting it out. Uh, so on the Fords, it's the other way around. They're, the exhaust on the Ford is really terrible, but they have great intake ports. So anyway, here's our first 100 right there. Now let's finish this up and see what we got. And... One thing I do want to express, and I think I've already expressed it, you really can't compare the volume of the port on this head to a normal Chevrolet head. Say, like I said, a double humps or 882s. The shape is so different in its design that, yeah, 182 sounds like a lot of runner volume right out of the box when you look at a double hump only being 157. And the bow tie is coming in at 180, but the way they shaped it is just not in the same realm. What you're looking at here with the original Vortec head is the beginning of the change of, Ever of Chevrolet engineering to what is now known as the Cathedral Port on the LS1s and 7s and all that. Alright, here we go. Now, yeah, this is when they started going real tall and making the width not as much. They started playing with that because it's, it's a fact that a tall port that is thin but is tall with the same cross-sectional area automatically has a higher velocity. It's because of the change it has to make from a rectangle to a circle. It has a pressure drop deal in there where it, it makes it faster. More on that later on. All right, here we go. I'm starting to see a little bit of fluid, not a whole lot, All right, about, we're past 182, 190, wow, 198, and whoa, I mean just right there, hold on a minute, 200, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't had this happen in a long time. We're right at 2, and it's just like a bubble. It's probably going to be right at 201. So, I guess I missed it this time by a few cc's. Not many. Alright. Wow, that's, that's impressive. I... But it's right there at 200. I mean, it might be a tenth of a cc. It just almost had to bubble. Okay, now I'm going to look. Here we go. <laughs> I told you, 201. Right on the money, 201 cc's out of the TBI head. <laughs> That's impressive. It would really be impressive if this thing had been a double hump or... Uh, 882, which I, I know 882 couldn't do it. I have actually got a set of double humps fully ported with the tube using my sonic checker. I've actually hit 194 without busting through using a sonic checker. That's the biggest hump. But anyway, we know what we got now. We're at a 201cc intake runner. Okay. The thing I always do where I've got water, yeah. Uh, 
you gotta douse it as soon as you see see it if it's metal I go in there and douse that turkey with WD-40 I don't care if it gets a little bit on the floor I wipe it up if you don't go in there and do that in just a short amount of time this thing will rust and even though it wouldn't make any difference really uh, don't want a customer to get ahead and go the ports are rusting right out of the box so anyway there we go let's go okay now we're going to CC the combustion chambers uh, this is going to be real interesting you know, I'm going to mind telling you, this was a real battle in my mind here. It was a pretty much intense thought process because I know the head is a swirl head. And when you look at the chamber on these things, you can tell that they tried to incorporate the swirl into the combustion chamber what somewhat. But it's one of them battles of... Okay, do I bank off the side of the chamber to create the swirl? How much air am I losing by that chamber being so close to the valve? It's uh, It was a hard choice to make, and I'm not saying for sure I made the 100% effective one in a certain area, but sometimes, guys, when you're doing this, you have to go with your heart. Just your experience, seeing what you've done. And it told me to do it the way that I done it, which was mainly on the intake side. I virtually didn't touch nothing on the exhaust. All right, here we go. We're zeroed out. And uh, these heads have real small combustion chambers, so they have a little bit of dish in the piston. Uh, if Philip was building the motor, right now I can tell you for a fact he would need to go to a flat top and he would really have a ball buster for sure. Hopefully it ain't too much of a loss. I think these things, I didn't see, see it before I started. Bad mistake. But I think they're around 64. Okay, hold on. And... Wow. 71 cc's on the money. 71 cc's. This thing would be a dead ringer with a flat top. It would put it around 9.7 or so to 1, especially if Philip had it zero decked. Anyway, 71 cc's is what we got. All right, that's all the cc I'm going to do for right now. We got to start prepping the rest of the things. We'll get back in a minute.